And there we go. Steve, take it away. Okay, good evening, everybody. Hello, welcome to the 2020 History Maker Awards. As I said before, my name is Steve Dyer and I'm the host for the evening. We really appreciate you that you've joined us in this virtual universe to show your support for our organization and this year's History Maker and Lavender Rhino Award honorees. The mission of the History Project is to document and preserve the history of L Boston's LGBTQ communities and to share that history with LGBTQ individuals, organizations, allies, and the public. So much of what the History Project does is about creating spaces for people to come together around LGBTQ history and life. And in this year, um, a year with that has had just so much year in it, uh, the History Project has been working very hard to create spaces online where community members can come together to talk about LGBTQ history, to meet others interested in LGBTQ history, and to, well, see if we can't have some more fun uh, than the debate later and dedicate one hour to enriching our souls. Since April of this year, History Project staff and volunteers have hosted 18 virtual out of the archives events that have reached a combined audience of more than 1,000 people from around the world. Recordings of these virtual events are available for all to freely access on our YouTube page where they've been viewed more, by more than 2,000 people from around the world. And tonight, you'll learn more about the volunteer-driven work of the History Project. Uh, you'll have a chance to meet some of our other attendees. And finally, you'll hear from our History Maker awardee, Dr. Thea James. Dr. James is the Associate Professor of Emergency Medicine at Boston Medical Center, Boston University School of Medicine. Uh, but before that, I'd like to introduce History Project intern, Erin Walsh, who will tell you about her summer internship transcribing and conducting oral histories. Uh, and then we'll hop out into hop into some break rooms um, to do our best impersonation of a cocktail party schmooze fest that we normally get in other years. Erin? Hi, uh, so my name is Erin Walsh uh, and I'm a student at Smith College out in Northampton. This summer I had the opportunity to do a remote internship at the History Project. I was fortunate to be able to receive funding through Smith's Praxis program to support the internship um, with the History Project and a lot of this kind of independent community history work in general being primarily volunteer driven. Uh, I recognize it was a really great privilege to be able to dedicate my time to this work while also being compensated for it. And I certainly hope that in the future, the History Project will continue to receive material and financial support to bring in more students like me to do this crucial work because I had uh, just a really fantastic time this summer. It was my first time doing a digital internship. Um, and even though it was you know, untar uncharted territory, um, it was really exciting to get to work together with Joan to think about how we could do digital archives and public history work in ways that are creative and meaningful and kind of meet this moment during this time when we cannot all physically be together at the archives in person. So tonight I'm just gonna talk a little bit about uh, some of the oral history work I did this summer and about oral history in general, how uh, their voice, their ways that we can hear someone's story in their own voice and see oral histories as a site to uplift the voices of those who have not been well documented in the archives over time. So I had uh, the great pleasure of doing a lot of transcription work with existing oral histories in the History Project's collection. Um, I transcribed interviews from people like uh, Barney Frank, Professor Ibrahim Sunjata, and Kim Crawford Harvey of Arlington Street Church, just to name a few, so that we could make these stories accessible and available on online platforms that anyone can log on to and use, like YouTube or, uh, of course, the History Project's Omeka website. Um, and I also had the opportunity to interview Miriam Rosenberg, who uh, was a local psychiatrist who worked with a number of uh, gay and lesbian doctor organizations, uh, worked at Fenway Community Health, and served as an expert witness in lesbian custody suits. Um, it, as just a few examples of like a plethora of uh, gay and lesbian activism that she has been involved with over the course of her life. Um, so it was a really kind of great opportunity to get to uh, sit down uh, over Zoom and uh, chat deeply with her. And getting to hear people describe their lives, their experiences, and how they kind of weaved through their identities and their activism in their own words is 
so incredibly powerful, even for me as someone who loves archives and loves oral history and doesn't need a whole lot of convincing that this work is important. I still find myself really floored by how impactful it is to sit down and listen to an interview. Um, and especially for me as a young queer person, uh, I feel really grateful to be able to have these resources to learn from elder members of my community. Um, so we are going to play a quick excerpt from one of the interviews that I transcribed to give you a sense of how incredible some of these oral histories really are. Um, so this clip that we're going to play in a second is from Reverend Kim Crawford Harvey, uh, and she's here describing her experience officiating the first sort of legally sanctioned gay wedding in the United States at Arlington Street Church in 2004. Andrew's pulling it back up. Day like I remember. Oh you my saying, God! <laughs> I remember you saying by the authority vested in me by the company, and I didn't hear the rest Anything because else, people were you? screaming. And exactly. That was the moment when, oh my God, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Exactly. Exactly. And for me, my children should tell this story. Um, I had rehearsed that over and over and over again because I couldn't get through it without literally like just completely coming undone, like sobbing. And I would try it like spontaneously, like I'd be in the shower and I'd try it and it was all over, you know. I would try it at the dinner table and the girls were like, mommy, come on, you can, mommy, come on, you can do it, you know. Anyway, no go, right? I had never gotten through it before that day. And trust me, like I say to my couples when I marry them, I am the least important person here today, you know. None of this has anything to do with me. I'm just like midwifing you and the great, you know, the great thing that's happening here. I'm trying to make myself really small and what if I burst into tears, mm -hmm. right? You know, so then we have 86 news outlets plugged into you yeah. know, the soundtrack and yeah. sound system. The place is packed and I'm like, if you mess this up, you've like messed it up for everybody forever. Like girl, you have to represent. And still, I'm standing in here going, trying it over and over, I can't do it, right? So I clean it up, I go out there and I'm like, I need a miracle. So I put my hand in the air and I say, and now by the power vested in me, by the, as you heard it, like, I don't know how much I got out. You did. And because the crowd went nuts, <laughs> it gave me the opportunity to like bite right through my lip and step back and like, be empowered and finish the sentence. And it's hilarious. You can see it on YouTube. And I literally collapse against the back of the pulpit. It's like it's like someone has like shoved me back. Like you you're only watching the boys, so you have to watch for that moment. Like because again Well the game is choir was behind And they were all behind me. Yeah. But um, you know, up high because the pulpit's so high. So I'm just like I just literally like fell back into the wood. That's yeah. a great story. Oh my god, it was so wonderful. Yeah. So, yeah, that was great. Um, and especially now, uh, as the pandemic makes the future seem more uncertain than ever, it's really vital that we capture these stories from the past and the present, that we find ways to connect and uplift each other, even from a distance. So I invite you all to explore our queer history and consider how you can support our mission to document, preserve, and share LGBTQ history, uh, either by donating your time, um, a collection, or through financial support. Thank you very much. Thank you, Erin. Um, that was great. So, uh, so now we're gonna, like I said, we're gonna try to keep it like most years. Um, for me, the History Project, I get to meet so many people um, and connect with them in kind of the happy hour part. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna break out into, uh, into breakout rooms to do our best to replicate this. So you're gonna be assigned randomly to some of the other people that are here. Um, I would encourage you if you do feel comfortable uh, to obviously to unmute, but also to turn on your camera. So, you know, do whatever needs to happen before that camera turns on. Make sure that everything's okay. Um, and if, and my suggestion is, if you um, 
if it gets a little bit of a lull, the I would suggest that you just do uh, rapid fire show and tell and just wherever you are, find the gayest or queerest object in your room and do <laughs> show, show and tell around the group. Um, so we're gonna do this for a couple of minutes. We'll, you'll get a little like one minute warning, but have fun, make some new friends. Um, and we'll see you on the other side in a couple of minutes. All right, I think they're all back now. Okay. That was fun. <laughs> awesome. Okay, so what I would encourage people to do is if is just to, if someone had like, if anyone took the prompt and found a, a, a spectacularly gay item that sh that is notable that the rest of the group should know about, uh, drop it in the chat or hold it up. Um, ours was like, we, we could have done better, but we could have done worse. So if you direct yourself to uh, Kathy, Kathy, Kigan or Kigan, she has uh, she has this art project or this piece of art that has like it's like a broken hearted cat um, that her gay friend who's an artist drew painted for her and I thought that that was very nice. That's excellent. Uh, and we're saying that Tim Tim Fitzgerald, do you have enough? Do you have one? Steve, you know me. I, why would I have anything gay in my this, house? Dog. This is recorded. This is recorded. Okay, great. We're, we're good. We're good. Go ahead. Go this ahead. This is like when I when I um, need to take a break from being on video, I just put this head up for me. <laughs> that and is then I just can creep back out to the bar. That's awesome. Yeah. All right, cool. It's, it's real diamonds. It's like I'm going to bequeath this to the history project. I'm sure it's worth millions. Millions, millions in um, sentimental value. All right, well, we're gonna move on. We're gonna mute Tim and now I'm gonna kick it over. <laughs> I love you, Tim. I know you, I love you, Tim. We're gonna kick it over to uh, to Joan Alakwa, who's um, the, what's your title? Executive Director of the uh, History Project. Yep. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Joan Alakwa. I'm Executive Director of the History Project. I wasn't in a breakout room, but the campiest item in my house is behind my head actually. It's a uh, needlepoint of a coquettish 80s clown. And I'll put my head back because I'm sure somebody has a phobia uh, and doesn't want to see that. So I don't know if it's strictly gay, but it's very camp. So um, I have the, the pleasure of doing some thank yous before we move on to our conversation with Dr. Thea James. Um, and first of all, thank you to Dr. James for being here tonight um, and, and being part of our History Maker Awards conversations. So I'd like to thank the planning committee of the History Maker Awards. And this year that included Carissa Cunningham, Andrew Elder, Ben Federlin, Tony Grimma, and Jessica Taylor, who have been on Zoom for hours and days this month putting these together. So thank you to all of you uh, for helping us to do that remotely this year. And thank you as well to tonight's MC, Stephen Dyer, who is away in Detroit right now doing uh, voter protection work, because it's not just that you are a wonderful MC, you're a great person. So thank you, Steve. Um, and thank you to our marquee, so sponsor thank yous. Uh, thank you to our marquee sponsor, Eastern Bank, who recently uh, let us know about their sponsorship and to the members of our 2020 host committee. Um, first, I'd like to thank those who contributed at our underground historian level, which includes Libby Bouvier and Andrea Devine, uh, Andrew Elder and Jose Ricardo McFarlane Figueroa, Jim Gibson, Pat Kazemba and Karen Kahn, Tony Grimma and Peter Muse, Joan Alacqua and Sarah Marina, Marvin Kabakoff, Mark Crone, Louise Rice, Susan Ryan Volmar, Martha Stone, Jessica Taylor, Kenneth Torino, and Christopher Matias. And then I'd like to thank those who contributed at our direct action documenter level Bruce Bell and George Smart, Nan Ma, Gail Kane and Charles Schoonmaker, Stuart Landers, Russell Lopez and Andrew Sherman, and last but certainly not least, um, our community curator level sponsor, Kevin Hefner. So thank you to all of you um, for making this seri series possible, for your support of the History Project's mission to document, preserve, and share LGBTQ history. Um, as a teaser throughout this month, we've raised 70% of our $25,000 goal, which is so amazing. And it's with the support of our community that we're able to do this work. Um, and we are just so appreciative of all of you. So if you're interested in donating or learning more about what we do and how you can donate, I'll drop a link in the chat to our website for you. And now it is my pleasure. 
there we go, um, to introduce Dr. James. Um, Dr. James is this year's, one of this year's 2020 History Maker honorees. Uh, Dr. James is Associate Professor of Emergency Medicine at Boston Medical Center, uh, Boston U University School of Medicine. She's dedicated her career to public health, equity, in community and has made a significant impact addressing violence and trauma in communities. I'm so pleased to honor you, Dr. James, as a 2020 history maker. Congratulations. And so. Thank you so much. So I was late. muted. Thank you so much, Joan. And, <laughs> and, and I just want to thank everyone from the History Project. I'm really honored, really and truly deeply honored and was surprised. Um, to uh, to receive this award. So thank you so very much. I appreciate it. Uh, it is our pleasure and it's my pleasure tonight to um, have a conversation with you. I get to play interviewer uh, <laughs> this evening to talk about your career. Um, and so for those of us who don't know Dr. James uh, closely, I have a short bio that I'm gonna read and then we'll we'll kick it off some, with some questions. So Dr. James is a graduate of Georgetown University School of Medicine. Uh, she is an associate professor of emergency medicine at uh, BMC, Boston University School of Medicine, president of the Boston Medical and Dental Staff. Um, she's also the director of the Boston Medical Center um, site of the Massachusetts Violence Intervention, Intervention Advocacy Program. Dr. James has chaired and served on national committees within the Society for Academic Emergency Medicine. She's also a member of the Boston University School of Medicine Admissions Committee and was appointed to the Massachusetts Board of Registration and Medicine where she served as chair of the licensing committee. Uh, Dr. James' passion is in public health, both domestically and globally. She's a supervising medical officer on the Boston Disaster Medical Assistance Team under the Department of Health and Human Services, which has responded to several disasters in the United States and abroad, uh, including New York City after 9-11, New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina, uh, Iran after the earthquake in 2003, Port-au-Prince, Haiti after the earthquake in 2010. Um, and for many years, Dr. James has traveled to Haiti with colleagues and emergency medical residents. She also serves on the board of Equal Health, an organization that partners with local practitioners in Haiti to create strong, sustainable medical and nursing education systems. So Dr. James, you have a lot going on. Thank you so much for taking some time for to be here with us tonight. Um, and I just wanna say in particular, thank you for your recent COVID related work. Um, you're a member of the Boston COVID-19 Health Inequities Task Force. You work in the emergency department at BMC. Um, and in particular, thank you for your frontline service. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank You're you. welcome. <laughs> um, so my, my first question for you, I know we, we've all heard the bio now, um, but you know, just a background question to kick us off. Could you tell us about how you came to a career in medicine? Sure. Um, it, you know, I was taking a lot of um, science classes in undergraduate school and um, we got assigned to, if we wanted to, we could um, join this pre-med club and you could get assigned to physicians and healthcare providers in the community. And I was assigned to a surgeon and I got to go to the operating room with him twice a week. And on Fridays, he, he moonlighted in an ER. And um, I think it just happened right then, you know, and, and just the notion of, you know, not knowing what's coming you know, you really don't know what's coming in terms of patients, what they have, what their issues are. Um, but having the opportunity to be that person who can shift their perspective, you know, no matter how they arrive and what they come with and, and, and being able to actually see that happen right in front of you. And, uh, you know, and, and besides, I mean, medicine is fascinating, you know, in and of itself. Um, but for, for me, I enjoy the people more than anything. And, mostly because, as I said, you just get to um, give them a perspective they may not have had before. And people don't often listen, you know, to patients anyway. So I really enjoy that. And, you know, there's a lot of reward in that because, you know, it impacts their lives. They don't teach you that in medical school, by the way. No, well, I mean, I can't speak because I didn't go to medical school. So I'll hold my comments to myself about that, um, <laughs> about medical education. but. Um, so you have a really, I think, 
patient focus, person focus, and also environmental focus in the, the work that you do and the organizations that you serve, um, that you serve. Uh, did you always want to work in public health once you started getting into the medical field? Well, you know, that's sort of, you know, the, the two are not separate. Um, for many years, I would say for 25 years, I was purely clinical, you know, as I said, again, in, in, in the emergency department. And um, you understand, uh, if you engage with people, you understand that the problems they show up with are not necessarily due to them not taking a medication of some sort. Or if they didn't take it, it's they did not take it because they did not want to take it. You know what I mean? There's generally something else going on there. And so um, a lot of it has to do with where they live, environments. A lot of it has to do with um, um, neighborhoods and zip codes. You know, as people say these days, your zip code um, is more important um, to your health outcome than, than, than your genetic code. There's more related to that. It's predictable. But then you have to pull that back another layer and ask, why is that so, you know, why does that happen? Why are those things so prevalent in certain neighborhoods, in certain zip codes? And then you have to pull back another layer and say, how did that get that way? Because it's not natural. You know, those kind of situations are created. And so, um, you know, if public health is, is um, you know, really at the root, you know, very much so of what you see in, uh, in, in your patients when they come in the emergency department. So now I work primarily in administration. I still work in the emergency department two days a month, but I'm vice president of mission and associate chief medical officer now. And it's, it's a, like taking those, those things, those lessons learned and applying those on a systemic level. And so that you're able to sort of, um, transform you know the paradigm of of how you deliver care for people and what your ultimate goal is for people not to just reset them back to baseline but understand all the various different <laughs> things that are involved like public health and make sure you start there because otherwise otherwise you are just resetting them back to baseline and discharging them back to exactly what's driving it so speaking of zip codes um when did you, how long have you been working in Boston? When did you come to Boston? I came to Boston in 1991. Mm -hmm. from, you know, straight from medical school in DC, from Georgetown. And what was it like when you, when you came here? Oh, I think that, <laughs> you mean the difference or? or the difference or, or could you describe what it was like to, to work in Boston and especially to work at, I think at the time it was Boston City Hospital. Right. Um, in the early nineties. Right. Like what, what was so, that like? When I was in medical school, we rotated through nine different hospitals and they were a, a spectrum and a, a variety of various different types of hospitals. And I decided that the hospitals I liked best were the hospitals that served people um, who were primarily living in um, disinfested communities. And so um, I, I, I liked that, that, that population, you know, and so, um, my experience with that in DC was at DC General Hospital, which no longer exists. And so when I came to uh, uh, BCH, um, it was that on steroids, quite frankly. And, um, and, and I'm saying that because there was also an intentionality, um, or, uh, there was this activism piece that was also existing um, at, at BCH. And uh, you, know, you were encouraged and nurtured you know, to focus on advocacy because there are a lot of policies and things that, you know, have created these situations and drive these situations you see coming through the door every single day. So it's not that you were just, um, you know, working on uh, the medical pieces of people, but also understanding, you know, the policies and things that were involved in what created those, those environments. And so um, it was a great place. The other reason I, the other thing I liked about it was, um, it was a place that um, really liked uh, creativity um, and really encouraged you and supported you to be creative. Uh, in fact, the more out of the box, you know, uh, that, that your ideas were, um, you know, the, the more likely they were to move forward, you know, because they would support you and, and nurture you and, and mentor you at the exact same time. Um, 
uh, it, you know, Marsha and Susan, I remembered them when I was an intern. I mean, they were a part of that, very much a part of that entire advocacy piece. So uh, that's why, you know, that's one of the reasons why I liked it so much. I love the patient population um, as well. I do not like the cold. Um, I really don't like the cold. I mean, I, to this day, I don't like the cold. I think I'm, I'm colder now than I was then even. So, um, but otherwise, you know, it was good. And then I met my spouse here. So, um, you know, that was wonderful as well. And it's been wonderful. It's like 26 years now. Oh, wow. Yeah, 26 like years. La 26 years last week. Well, happy anniversary. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. And I know your spouse is here. Irene is here somewhere. I don't, I don't know if her camera's on, but um, so when you, when you came to Boston um, and, and rather, let me think of how to put this, I have two questions in my mind and I'm going to do my best to be a good interview and ask, and ask them one at a time um, instead of bombarding you. But um, in Boston, in the early nineties, it's sort of the same time period where like the family vans being created. There's, I think, um, a shift to, maybe not a shift, but finally an acknowledgement of community medicine in addition to healthcare at the hospitals. Did you ever interact with those folks, with people like like um, Nancy, what is Nancy's last name, uh, who worked at Beth Israel? Do you know who I'm talking about? Nancy Norman? <laughs> no. Um, no, Nancy. Oh goodness. Anyway, um, <laughs> so maybe we can segue this into sort of a question about collaboration. Were you always working within, you know, the confines of, of BMC, or were you collaborating with other folks around Boston okay. on the work that you were doing? Oh, it's all about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even today, you have to do that. You, um, you know, hospitals can't do it alone. It requires multi-sector partnerships. I mean, people you see in the hospital are coming from someplace else. And where they're coming from is where a lot of, you know, the, the changes have to happen. So um, we very much believe in multi-sector partnerships. I mean, my primary job now is I'm responsible for coordinating and maximizing our uh, relationships and strategic alliances, you know, from a wide range of like local, regional, even national organizations. Um, and even in town here, you know, with community organizations and, uh, you know, grassroots organizations, all levels, people in finance, foundations, all types of, uh, you know, organizations and, and even government, you know, even working with city and state government, you, you know, you need all of those um, entities sort of working together to, uh, you know, to achieve common goals. That's really, really, really important. Excellent. So the name I was thinking of was Nancy Oriel and I, her name flew out of my head. No, uh, I didn't, I didn't, uh, I didn't work with her earlier in the 90s. No, I didn't. I haven't worked yeah. with you. That's, it's uh, coming from my background is I used to work at Harvard Medical School. So I know about those affiliated institutions, which yeah. I suppose is a, a, says something about how Boston silos itself uh, within neighborhoods and institutions and communities um, that I know more about them than I do about the work at BMC. Um, but I wonder too, thinking back to sort of the earlier days in Boston, um, were you out when you came up here? <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> yes, I was, I was. You know, it's, um, it's, I mean, when I first came up here, I mean, I was working like a hundred hours a week, you know, I had very little, uh, you know, very little time to socialize and things. I mean, I think for, for an entire year, I probably wasn't aware of a whole lot of things. I mean, because back then when you were an intern, you worked for, when you started in June, you, you didn't get a day off until like November. That's when they would first start, um, you know, giving you uh, days off and things like that. So, um, but yeah, I was, I was definitely out for sure. You didn't have to like, you know, you didn't have to, be, you know, hide that in that, in that particular environment. Georgetown was a different story, you know, and, and you know, it, it was a different story. <laughs> Just leave it at that. And um, so after your first year, at least after starting to settle into being in Boston, um, you know, did you find support within like the black queer community here? Were you able to like, you know, find your people 
when you got here? Yeah, I mean, I did. I found them, you know, here and there, um, you know, here and there. And then, you know, you find one person and they introduce you to other people and then other people and other people. Um, <clears throat> that's, that's how uh, my spouse and I met as well. Someone introduced us and um, yeah, I mean, but again, you know, I was a busy person, you know, uh, didn't have a ton of, uh, you know, time to socialize, but, um, but I was definitely, but I got to meet people a little at a time. And as I had more time over the next couple of years or so, you know, the community, you know, grew and expanded a bit. Yeah, and were there any organizations in those days that you worked with or businesses you went to that you might want to mention? that sort of give us the picture of like what you were up to in this earlier part of your career? In the early part of my career, I wasn't in a lot of social organizations because um, again, you know, I just, you know, didn't have a ton of time. And, you know, unfortunately it was mostly um, work related stuff, but on more national levels, you know, um, I was, you know, I belonged to LGBTQ things in, in my work. Um, and, uh, oh yeah, Marsha will probably say, how could you forget this? I was um, um, the, the BMC or Boston representative to uh, the Committee of Interns and Residents. That's a national organization, um, which is a, a resident, uh, doctor's resident, doctor's union. And um, I really liked that a lot. And uh, it was it was quite it was uh, quite an experience. So uh, so definitely uh, that took up a you know a bit of time as well because it also required traveling because then meetings were in New York and things like that. So yeah, so from early on you were already looking at or already doing national service. Um, so most of my next questions are kind of specific about some of the programs that you've worked for over time. Um, and what they were, how they were, how you came to be involved with them, that sort of thing. So the first one I was curious about is the Violence Intervention Advocacy Program. Could you tell me about that? Sure. Um, so the Violence Intervention Advocacy Program actually was a, um, you know, it's a program for young people who come in with injuries like gunshots and stabbings and things like that. And there had been a lot of, um, those injuries going on in the previous years in the 80s and 90s. And then the Boston miracle happened. Uh, and I'm still not sure um, what that is or was, you know, several people um, claim, you know, having, you know, initiated that and executing that. But at any rate, what it did was, you know, all of the, um, you know, the, the, the rates of those, those incidents went down. But then there was a resurgence. And so Mayor Menino came to us in 2006 and asked us to, in the words of Mayor Menino, do something, <laughs> that's what he said. And, uh, you know, we got some early funding to start this program. And, you know, the interesting thing about this program was, you know, there were only about three hospitals in the country who had those kind of programs. And one of them had started to publish um, and about, uh, measures of success. And the first paper we read, uh, the measures of success were things like re-injury, reincarceration, that type of stuff, but, you know, dropped out of school. I just couldn't understand, you know, what they were trying to achieve, but we knew we wouldn't do that. We set really high bars. And, um, you know, we had really great outcomes for these young people. And I also want to say that, you know, it, it's a, it's a, their tattoos, I learned a lot from their tattoos. You know, if you get shot and you're a, a, a black man or a brown man, a black woman or a brown woman, people, you, you're stigmatized. People automatically think that, you know, you must be some kind of bad human being. But, you know, the, their tattoos would say things like born to be hated, dying to be loved, you know, things like that. Or, you know, living is hard, dying is easy. And uh, so um, I, I felt that these were, they were hope, you know, they had, they were hopeless, feeling hopeless, didn't see a place for themselves in this world. And so um, we just set high bars. I mean, where you said it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So we just did that and um, just created a pathway for them to achieve at their highest levels. 
and their greatest desires and and they you know they they do it you know they go out and they get college degrees they go out and get graduate degrees i mean they go on and um start businesses all kinds of things you know they do when you get rid of these sort of systemic barriers and things like that that have you know stifled them and kept them from blooming you know and thriving and so um and that's sort of like a model, if you think about it, is what a lot of people are thinking and talking about now. Although, believe me, there are people who have been talking about this for years, you know, um, I mean, long years, you know, like Dr. Kamara Jones. I mean, she's been talking about this forever. My spouse has been talking about it forever. So um, it's, it's, uh, it's, not, it's not new, but there's been, you know, new, new focus on it, new spotlight on it particularly given, you know, given the events of this year. So, but that, but that's what that is. And by the way, so we were one of the founding um, hospitals or founding members of that organization. Um, and we have a national conference now. It's in three countries in addition to ours. And it's now, by the way, it just changed its name to the, the um, uh, Health Alliance for Violence Intervention. So, um, you know, it's, it's a change now and uh, just continues to evolve and grow. And it is also been effective in things like policy. As a matter of fact, policy is one of the arms of the um, organization. That's amazing. Um, and I'd never heard of, well, I'd never heard of the Boston Marathon. So I Googled it while we were talking to give folks some context about this 1996 Boston Gun Project and Boston Miracle Operation Ceasefire that tried to stop youth gun violence. And like you said, that worked for a time and then stopped working. Right. And I, I'm curious, and it sounds like the work that you're doing now is more getting at rather than the um, tip of the iceberg problem and starting to look at the, the systemic problems within Boston. And so um, my next question was about being a member of the National Network of Hospital-Based Violence Intervention Advocacy Programs. <laughs> And is that what is now the Health Alliance for Violence Intervention? Yes, the Javi. Okay. <laughs> um, and so, uh, so yeah, so now you, you're taking this and you're doing it on, a, on an international scale, yes. which is amazing. Um, could you tell us a bit about um, some of these other national pro projects and programs that you, you've done? I think it's important for us to, to hear from you um, about how your work is making a difference, not just to us locally, but to, to people all around the world. It's something that like, I'm in awe of all of the things that you have done. And so, can well, you yeah. tell us about it? Well, first of all, I wanna say, this is not about me. You know what I mean? This is not about me. You, I, I can't do anything by myself, you know? You need like multiple diverse, perspectives and voices at the table. You really, 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 you know, you really absolutely need that. And um, I mean, I think I've gained and learned something from all of that, you know, all those various different organizations. I mean, a, a, a friend of mine who used to be one of my residents, um, we formed a nonprofit some years ago called Unify for Global Healing. And uh, we would work with organizations in um, you know, uh, non-government organizations and, and mostly in Haiti. We did uh, work in uh, Ghana, in West Africa, and we did some work in India as well. And, you know, one of the things I learned from early years of going to Haiti and working in Haiti is that uh, you, ideally you want to address what matters to the people there, have them identify what they, uh, you know, what they can help you with. And, Ideally, it's something that be that becomes a part of their own infrastructure. You know, you don't want to do something that you go there and you do something, and when you leave, it's gone. It has no impact. You know, it has no no long term um, impact on people. And so, for instance, people would give people in Haiti they would donate ultrasound machines to them. They wouldn't know what to do with these things. And uh, so, you know, we would uh, we would teach ultrasound there. And and and. Uh, and then sometimes people will want to know, like after the earthquake in Haiti, there was a lot of trauma, as you might imagine. People had a lot of trauma. And, uh, you know, we would go there and we would take 
um, art uh, therapists and people like that there. And they would do train the trainer type things. We would take um, uh, people there who were experts in yoga. And you know, it's an interesting thing after the earthquake in Haiti, every time I went there afterward to see people walking around with yoga mats, children even, you know, that was a normal, it was a normal, uh, you know, image to, you know, when you were walking around the streets. Um, and then um, I belonged to um, another uh, organization called Equal Health that was formed right after the, the earthquake in Haiti. It initially started out as being called Physicians for Haiti, but then it sort of evolved to um, Equal Health because it started out as doctors, um, you know, working with doctors in Haiti and medical students and attendings and things like that uh, to partner with them to create their own infrastructure around, around uh, you know, medical curriculums. But then we also started, we added nurses and the nurses started doing their own work, you know, as well. So, um, you know, we, uh, we, we changed that a little bit. And then we started working with the hospital in Mirabale, which is, um, a hospital that is part of the, um, you know, part of the 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 the, the, the I'm trying to remember the name of this system, um, Partners in Health and others there, and uh, you know they it's a very modern hospital with CAT scans and things like that and a lot of residency programs. I mean, in, t in fact, pres residency directors from here um, started the emergency medicine. Um, emer uh, residency in Haiti. That was the first one that started now, probably almost four years ago, five years ago. They've already graduated a couple classes um, of residents. And so that has become a specialty in the country. And so I've gone down there and done visiting professorships and, and um, things like that. And then the other thing was being a part of the uh, disaster medical assistance team, which was um, really, really interesting. I think I did that for like 18 years. And uh, you always are generally in these austere environments. I mean, you don't know, you don't know, you know, what you're gonna arrive, what it's going to be like when you arrive there. Um, sometimes you get there and there are no, uh, you know, there are no bathrooms, <laughs> you know, they make them, they create them. You know, you sleep outside a lot. Sometimes you sleep inside, but like in, in Katrina, we slept in a gym, I think. But, um, uh, you know, but in, in other cases, you're outside. In Iran, we were, you know, outside, um, sleeping on the ground. And the same thing in Haiti, exact same thing. There was a, a building that was a little rickety that we stayed in uh, there as well. Um, but those things are all interesting because you're interacting with people from different cultures and, and you uh, have to honor that. And, and, you know, you have to get interpreters and, and then you're working together, you know, once again, as a team with like, you're working 12, 13, 14, 15, sometimes 16, you know, hours a day and uh, no showers in many cases, <laughs> depending upon where you are and you, you're there for a couple of weeks and, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting, but you always feel like you are learning something and you are somehow making uh, an, a situation improve for a person. And you know, we, are all, we always can see to um, the culture of the place and the individuals. It's very, very, very patient focused and, uh, and, and person focused, maybe more so than here, quite frankly. I was going to ask, so the back to two questions. Um, there's one I want to ask you about the partners that you, you've worked with over time and the colleagues that you've worked with. Um, you mentioned the, and you talked about training and um, did you have any role models in this work? In that work? Yeah, in, your, in your work in general, but like I can think it's, it's interesting. Uh, my other question was going to be, and we can come back to the question, I'll remember it this time, um, was, you know, when you started the, the sort of community-based patient-focused work that you were doing here in America, did you imagine yourself going global? Because I think looking back, it makes so much sense that that's the sort of path that you've gone into, but did you imagine that for yourself when you started out? No, I did not. And, you know, a lot of people, uh, I go to, 
I talk with a lot of uh, professional development groups and things like that. And they all want to, you know, they're eager to hear. I mean, because I think people want to be able to imagine themselves and what's possible for, for them, you know. And um, I always tell them, I mean, I never really, uh, the only thing, I never really like plan to say I want to do this in five years, that in five years, 10 years. I never, I never did that. The only thing I ever did was uh, to do what, was I was passionate about and to do what mattered to, to, to me and generally, always generally, what mattered to me was what mattered to the people I was, you know, uh, who were depending on me. And so um, just, just doing, you know, what, 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 what I had a great passion for. And, uh, I'm, you know, quite honestly, just not being able to, um, to alter from, from that path or from that course. And it generally would just take you take you to these various different, on these various, on this journey. And, uh, you know, you wind up to, you know, where I am right now, like 113 years old. And so, um, you know, it just, it's just how it is. It's just how it happened. But I have to say, when I was in a um, uh, professional development uh, group, I remember how much better I felt um, on some level, hearing other leaders, including people who are senior to me right now, uh, come in and tell the, their stories. They used to have these things called conversation cafes. And the people at the highest levels, they all, they, none of them had that path in mind, you know, uh, at least the top three. And they just did what uh, they were passionate about, did what felt right to them at the time. Um, and, you know, had some intention around it once they identified it and that's what they did. And that kind of thing helps normalize people uh, who are feeling some kind of pressure to be something or to fit into something um, that they think they may not fit in, you know. Um, so I think it's helpful, you know, when you can do that for people to make them realize that, you know, they can do what they want to do. And they don't have to fit into something and they shouldn't judge themselves, you know, by others around them, you know, because it's really not helpful. And in medicine, that kind of thing can really, you know, that, real, that can really um, traumatize people because they're always measuring themselves against others around them. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm quite um, transparent about that. And so... Uh, you mentioned, so the path that you've taken is not, was not prescripted. We'll put it that way. There was not like a, a, you know, which I think is the best way to do it. Honestly, that's, I've never had a five-year plan and I've never considered it a deficit not to have one, um, right. because you never know what's going to happen next. So I am curious though, like, were there, um, you know, people who influenced your work or are there people that you've worked with that you like to tell us about who may have been partners? in the work that you've done. Um, so you mentioned you can't do it alone. So like, who are some of these, these other people we should know about? Well, you know, I'm a little reluctant to do that because there's so many. I don't wanna name somebody and, and miss somebody. And, you know, um, you know, uh, there've been a lot of people. Some of them are in this Zoom thing here right now, you know, um, and, uh, They've always just been people who were encouraging and, um, um, you know, people who I was able to like uh, learn from and, um, and also uh, people who I could talk with about things that were, I was curious about or things that, uh, that bothered me or that I uh, was struggling with or, or something like that. Um, but there, there are all kinds of people. I mean, you know, listen, I don't want to sound corny, but like, you know, my spouse, for example, right? Um, uh, she's probably my greatest supporter, but also, you know, my greatest, uh, she will critique me, you know, and I appreciate that, you know, because she is a person herself of like, she, she's, you know, um, she's got really high standards and things and morals and stuff like that. So, um, so she's one person. Um, 
I, I guess I can name a couple of people. Like, so when I started in my uh, administrative role, for example, nobody ever had this job that I have in the hospital. And, uh, you know, I had a job description, which is exactly kind of like what I explained to you, what I said my role is, um, but nobody had ever executed it and done it. So nobody ever knew what that was going to, to look like. And sometimes, um, you know, you, I'd have some questions in mind, like, is this going right? Is that going right? Um, you know, the way the culture works in, uh, you know, in the, in the, in the, in the C-suite or whatever. And I go talk to my CEO about these things and she would just like set everything right. And you, you know, she just has that way of, uh, of, uh, of being supportive um, or the guy I report to, or actually um, I mean, people who are younger than me, 20 years younger than me, you know, I mean, all 30 years younger than me. I mean, when you talk about mentors and, and people like that, I mean, I, I find them like all around me. I don't find, you know, it's not like it has to be somebody like you know, way ahead of me, more senior to me or anything, you know, it's um, whoever can feel, feel that, that space that you need at that moment um, and, and be impactful and effective is the right person at that time. Um, and all my colleagues across the country, you know, emergency medicine, there were not that many um, black African there were a few of us in a few programs across the country. And uh, whenever we'd have these national meetings, you know, we would meet up, you know, and sometimes we'd bounce around and go to each other's, um, you know, little re um, uh, receptions, you know, and we'd peek in and then we, you know, we'd peek out and then we'd go hang out together. And the people in my department used to tease me about that, you know, in fact. I mean, I was the only Black American, uh, African American ER doctor in my own department for a ton of years you know? And so um, they would tease me about that, you know, how we go, you know, be hanging out with my friends, but, um, and we all helped each other and we still do because you need to be able to touch base, base with someone who kind of like understands what you're going through. Cause, and what I mean by that is, For example, the things we've known for a very, very long time, of all the things we've learned in the last few months about how, why people are like, like they are, how they got where they are, we've been knowing these things for years. But you know, you, you, until people are ready to like hear that, you always have to be, um, you know, pretty, pretty, pretty intentional and that type of thing about you know how you deliver it or articulate it or whatever. And so there are a lot of things, you know, and how people might perceive patients and the things they might say about patients and things like that, you know, um, when they don't really understand why patients are like this and how they got like this. And sometimes, you know, we can even be um, uh, contributing to those things. And so um, you endure and witness a lot of those type things. But at any rate, you ask about others and definitely my colleagues around the country um, you know, in emergency medicine in particular. And we're still like, you know, we kind of grew up together. We came out of residency and, you know, we stuck with each other and helped each other's careers evolve and develop. And uh, it's still happening even now. That's excellent. I had a feeling with the way you were talking about everything, I hesitated to be like, so tell me about, give me a list of other people because there are a lot of people and I can understand the hesitancy to, you know, you don't want to miss anyone or you know, forget about something or um, not focus in. What you were talking about with like sort of meeting a person where they are and understanding um, how a patient might be treated when somebody is making assumptions. It just, it rung to me. It reminds me of, there's a book by uh, Gus White on culturally competent care and um, how that has changed over time. Where do you see the future of the, the sort of work that you're doing? And, you know, I'm, I, there's, by the History Project, we always end like our tours and a lot of our talks by, with, you know, there's still work to do. What's the, what's the work that's still happening? So, you know, the greatest challenge right now 
is shifting people's mindset. Because even with this awareness, awakening, whatever, reckoning, whatever you want to call it that's happened this year, and with all the focus that people have on equity and what they want to do and, you know, and transforming and things like that, people are, even when you give people everything that they would need, every resource in the world, and ask them to sit down with and create a blueprint or something, they are more likely to come up with, with what they've always done than to do something transformative. And I think one of the easiest ways to shift your mind about that is to just look at whatever you come up with and say, does it look different from what I've always done? And if it, if it doesn't look different, it's not the right thing because it's not going to have a different outcome. It's interesting when people look at people who come from, you know, other places like disinvested communities, it's almost like people, you know, they cannot imagine these people having the opportunities to be like, like us, you know, I'm not saying they want to be us, you know, but the, when I'm, when I'm saying be us, I mean, have all the freedom and the opportunity in the world to achieve at whatever you want to achieve. So people tend to, you know, be either paternalistic or, you know, prescriptive or in, in some low bar kind of a way to say or think what's good for a person. I am, I just, I don't, I don't, whatever it is, it's really deep entrenched in people. It's almost like a rubber band, you know, you talk about equity and these type of things and all the things people want to do, you know, it's like you stretch the, the, the rubber band, but when you sit down and start to do something, it just pops right back. I mean, because the gravitational pull to do what you've always done um, is really strong. Um, and quite frankly, you know, when you really, you know, peel all these things away, I mean, sometimes I try to get people to understand it by looking at it from a, a perspective of economics. I mean, I've tried a lot of different things because at, at the core, you know, at the real core is economic mobility and things like that, opportunities to build wealth and things like that. I mean, people think about that and it's almost like, no, that that's not possible. I present a, a different types of scenarios, you know, even like giving people something they can relate to, like back in the thirties when after the, you know, the, um, Great Depression in 1929 when the economy was down and like it is now, except it was worse and then creating pathways to wealth building and then redlining that made that pathway for some people, but not other people. And how, you know, how all of those things that happened at that time, how they've led to like right now, you know, I don't want to go into all of that, but listen, all those cities that were hot behind red lines, you know, those are the same cities where you had high rates of, of uh, COVID positive people and COVID deaths, exact same places. You know, there's a reason why all these things happen in certain communities and none of this stuff is new. You know, this is old stuff. But now, you know, at this point in time, people kind of like have some insight into it, but for whatever reason, it's hard for people to shift their mindset about altering quality of life course for people or seeing a different future for people. So um, there's a lot of work to do. And that is the first step, I think, is to change your, you know, shift your mindset. And, um, you know, I, I think until we are able and, and willing to do that, it's, uh, you know, it's going to, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be a, a, a bit of a, a journey. I think we can get there. I mean, I, I definitely have not, uh, I have not given up on that because we've already done it in smaller ways as proof of concept, theories of change. We've already done it, you know, at least, you know, where I work with the, the program you were talking about, the hobby and stuff like that. But um, I don't know, that, that is going to have to change or else it's going to be a long road, you know, going forward. Yeah. So I have, I think probably two more questions and then I, I would like to open it up to the audience too ask questions or to tell us stories about you. If that's what folks want to do. Oh. Um, <laughs> yeah, if they, 
if they're oh if they want to make comments um but uh so folks get just just be ready ready to turn on your camera or to write something in a chat um steve and i are happy to read it out loud if you don't want to uh turn on your microphone but um you mentioned your partner and and irene has mentioned reverend irene monroe has, has commented in the chat so i don't mind calling her out a little bit oh my god what is she saying <laughs> she's saying good stuff it's well it's good um and i was curious about um so please excuse me for saying you're kind of a power couple if you want to if you want to use that term is that term too cheesy it's but but you're both very very accomplished people do you see intersections between the work that you you both do um that you'd like to tell us about um first of all i don't understand that 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 what you're talking about there but um we you know we don't we don't think like that <laughs> trust me i we don't think like that you know what i mean <laughs> Um, uh, if you, if, no, if you see, see her telling me to like, pick up that or pick up that you wouldn't, you wouldn't, you wouldn't think that either. But, um, uh, well, I mean, maybe, you know, like she's a, she's a, she's a minister and she's also a, um, social justice person to the core. I'm telling you, I mean, pure to the core and, um, she's not going to compromise. I'm telling you on those things at all. And so, uh, but I think, you know, she is a, um, she delivers um, healing to people, you know, in her ministry and, uh, uh, and it, it's healing and it's also social justice at the same time, you know, it depends upon whatever, you know, the role is at that, at that moment, whichever she's doing. Um, and maybe I do something similar, you know, with uh, with my patients, and you know, people I encounter, you know, in the hospital, even, you know, colleagues and, and things like that, students, you know, who kind of just show up at any time, and I don't know where they came from. I never met them. They just walk in my office and tell me somebody sent them there. So, um, so maybe you know, those are some some ways in which you know we. You know, we uh, we make we, we're similar, you know, in our work. Yeah, and then so my final question for you is is the most open ended question. Is there anything else you want to tell us about what you do or who you are, or or any stories that you want to tell us about anything? <laughs> <laughs> oh, not really. No, not really. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> That's okay. If you think of something, you're always welcome to, as the, the person of honor this evening, you're always welcome to hop back in and, <laughs> and let us know. Um, thank you. Oh yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you again for, like I said, all of the work that you've done, all of the work that you are doing. Um, it amazes me to look at your bio and to look at everything you've done. And, and it's just, it really is amazing. Um, and I'm so happy that we get to highlight it and, and honor what you've done tonight. Um, Thank you so much. No, my, it's absolutely my pleasure. So we have a, a question from Pat and Karen. Right. Um, and they're asking in the chat, can, can Thea talk about the impact of COVID and what could be done with, what could be done with a change of leadership at the top? Okay, the impact of COVID. Impact of COVID on? I think, uh, well. Or in general? Pat, what were you thinking? In general or on certain populations or? Here, I hit the unmute button if you want to. Pat's controlling the mute. Um, oh, there we go impact on um, our uh, on communities here in Boston, um, but also nationally and and um, what 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 kind of future we can have here if we actually do have some change in a couple of weeks. Well, I mean, the impact was highly predictable. Listen, if COVID never happened, if somebody said to you, what if, you know, there was a pandemic you know, that happened uh, in, the, in the world and uh, what, who would be most impacted by it in America? 
I don't think you'd have to think for like two seconds. Because yeah. it it's always that, you know, if you look at it demographically, everything, you know, that's why, you know, it's always been that way. I just think, you know, people have not necessarily like, you know, uh, done a, you know, dissected that or looked closely at that. Some people have always looked at it, but not, not everybody, you know, for, for whatever reason. Well, I mean, it can't get worse. You're talking about a, a, a change at the top. We well, certainly can't get worse. I mean, it's got to get better. Um, remains to be seen, by the way, you know. Um, mm -hmm. I'm uh, hopeful, for sure. I mean, because right now it's like, uh, I don't know if I'm in a movie theater or a dream. I, it's, it's, you know, it's hard to know, but um, it's quite bad. And uh, not sure I've ever seen it quite this bad. So we'll see, we'll see what happens. I am hopeful though, we'll see what happens. So the, the next question is from, uh, I see one from Mark. I'm gonna ask Tim's question first though, Mark, because it's a little bit of a longer one. Um, so Tim's question is, you've given many hours to Anthony Croson's work with Boston Area Healthcare Health Education Center at BU Medical Campus for area youth to be exposed to science and clinical experience. Can you speak to other ways to address opportunity for underrepresented minorities, minorities in medicine, including higher ed, grad school, research and medical education, um, perhaps with a goal to graduate more scientists, master scholars, PhDs and MDs? Yeah, well, you know, there's a lot of things, there are a lot of things that are going on like around STEM and things like that, intentional things like that right now. Um, they have some schools that do that kind of work um, in the city of Boston. Um, uh, Dr. Elmer Freeman, who's a uh, professor at Northeastern, he has a Kennedy School, you know, that focuses on that. BMC actually has a program where they work with something called the Possible Pro uh, Project. They work with um, uh, students from Madison Park and they expose them to the hospital. They come and spend time there. And we even hire them there too. A good number of them we've hired. Um, but I think starting out at like a young age, but it's not, you know, the kids are not s separate from their parents. And uh, one of the things you have to do is, uh, you know, you have to cre create opportunities and situations in their lives and in their communities where they can prioritize these things, where they don't have to make a choice between surviving and that, you know? And, uh, you know, it's sort of like, it's any of us, it's, it's, hum it's human nature. I mean, you're going to focus on what you need first to survive and then you can focus on those things. But it's about exposure and, and um, having intentionality around you know, what you're planning to do and what you wanna do. These young kids are, when I speak to groups of kids, you know, who we, you know, someone wrote there, you know, we encounter them all the time, you know, talking to them all the time. We're gonna be talking to a group of kids really, really soon. Those kids are sitting there and they are quiet and they are focused on you, you know, they're listening to every word you say. And um, I mean, a large part of it is, uh, focusing on them, connecting with them as well, you know, not being someplace up here that they can't connect to and not able to see themselves in you. And so um, I think, you know, with great intentionality around that, uh, supporting them once they get in these spaces, you know, because these spaces can be, you know, unwelcoming and uh, uh, not supportive and that type of thing. So I don't think that that is incredibly uh, you know, hard to do. You just have to have intentionality around it. Excellent. And so the question from Mark, and, and again, folks, if you want to ask questions or if there's anyone who wants to turn off their mic and ask a question, please feel free. Um, Mark's question is, do you ever get into discussions with, uh, with Reverend Irene um, where you explore intersections of science and spirituality? Well, you know, that's that, that, that those, if I was ever in a conversation with anybody like that, it would be her, you know, cause she, you know, she is, you know, she's up there and uh, you know, she talks about these things and you know, she's, she's, uh, we recently been watching these, this series on TV and uh, you know, there's like sci-fi involved in it. There's history in it. It's amazing. It's like, oh my God, it is incredible. And she knows that I don't generally like sci-fi but um, 
she's gotten me on this one, you know, and uh, one day I found myself even binge uh, watching it in here with her, but uh, um, so we talk about things like that, but generally uh, uh, she's an interesting person to, to, to talk with. So we do have interesting conversations about, you know, things like that sometimes. Excellent. And so let's see, who else here? Anyone want to ask a question or make a comment? I see you all smiling at me, but. I, 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 as, as Thea spouse, I would like to make a comment. Um, the, the, the binge that we were watching was Lovecraft Country. That's oh. number one, which is a wonderful genre, a mixture of genres to bring up Black ancestral spirituality, uh, historical history, as well as think of a future. And so I always say to her that what expands your mind is when you stay out of the genre you're comfortable with and, and explore one that you're not. So, so, I, so we do, we'll talk about that and, and whatever we talk about, cause she likes the animal channel and so, so we'll, so when one dies, I say, well, I just bless that soul, but we will definitely find ways to uh, integrate the various ways in which our, our disciplines um, uh, do very much, uh, you know, intersect. And it's very hard with me being a minister and her being a doctor for there not to be just overlapping. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> Thank you, Reverend Monroe, for, for chiming in. <laughs> okay, so yeah, let's, I think we should give a moment for, uh, for any more questions. Please unmute. And if not, I'm going to uh, ask Dr. James, do you have the, um, the History Maker Award that was sent to you at hand, so we can give you a so we can give you a round of applause. Um, it's upstairs in my study. I, I'll, I'll, yeah, it's like if it'll take a minute, we should applaud. We should applaud. It's a it's an award show. Okay. Okay, I'll I'll vamp for a minute. Okay. Take your time. All right. I was hoping that she was that the uh, the show was called Outlander because that's the show that my mother watches, and she's always like, Steve, have you seen Outlander yet? And I always say no, and I would have had something to finally talk about because she's been she's been binging that, which again is another time traveling thing. I think it's more focused on women's history. I'm not sure. Well, I'd like to step in and accept the award for Dr. James, who couldn't be here. She's filming <laughs> somewhere else, but it's been a great career. And... No, okay. Um, uh, my my mother-in-law also watches Outlander, and I have not watched it yet. Which what have all seen. winter inside to do that? I I love it. Not only have I watched it, I've actually gotten Thea to watch the scene with with it almost was the court scene. It's very early on um, where Claire and the other time traveler from the 1940s were on sort of like it was a witch trial. So I got Thea. I'm getting her more and more into sci-fi. But absolutely. <laughs> but I got to say here. Uh, I've fallen in love with men in skirts. <laughs> so have I. And you both. That's why I love Kitts Creek. I'm happy to hear about Lovecraft because now that we've finished watching all of Shit's Creek and we've been feeling up Shit's Creek, <laughs> we, want, we want something else. So thanks for the tip about Lovecraft. It's excellent. Okay, and it looks like it looks like Dr. James is back. So yes, we're Joan, make sure you pin her so we can all yep. see the award. She's got it. Well deserved. Um, look at that. That's great. Congratulations, Dr. James. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Yes, and Joan, thank you for um, thank you for that lovely discussion. I think covered a lot. Of, I I mean, I love that discussion. I thought that was I learned so much. Um, so uh, you know, so the next thing I want to talk about is a little bit about ways that people can help support um, support the history project, and we keep doing programs like this. Um, so over the course of uh, over the course of the month of October, um, to celebrate our honorees like Dr. James, uh, as well as uh, LGBTQ History Month, 
the history project is aiming to raise $25,000 to support our work. Work that ranges from building archival collections that tell the complex and diverse histories of our LGBTQ community to providing spaces both in person and online where community members can come together to learn, to tell their own stories and to share in creating LGBTQ history. Um, so as of tonight, as Joan mentioned, we've raised already 70% of our $25,000 goal. So we'd really uh, like to support um, we're, we'll put the link in the chat. Your support tonight and throughout the month is what makes this work possible. It's what makes us uh, makes it possible for us to put together in-person and online events that challenge and inform and entertain. So your support makes it, um, makes it possible for activists and archivist volunteers to have a safe place to organize and preserve the historical records, photographs, and publications that tell our community's story. And your support is what makes it possible for us to digitize those historical materials so we can share them with community members and researchers around the world. Uh, we all have stories to tell and it's the mission of the History Project to document and preserve these stories and to share them with the world. We hope you'll make a donation tonight to help the History Project reach our fundraising goal. Visit historyproject.org support to make a donation. And we'll put that link in the chat. Um, so we hope that as, I, as we kind of wrap up now, we hope that you'll tell others about the History Project and the kind of work that it does, um, that you berate your group texts and close friends and you follow them on Instagram and to sign up for this event series. Uh, because what we, we've been celebrating History Makers all month. And next Thursday, we'll be joined by our History Maker Award honoree, Michael Cox. Uh, Michael Cox is an advocate for, advocate for prison abolition and LGBT prisoners in Massachusetts. He's the administrator for the Massachusetts Bail Fund, where he and his colleagues secure the release of over 100 people each month. Mm -hmm. And uh, as director of policy for Black and Pink Boston, mm -hmm. he cultivates state and federal legislation that reduces incarceration and improves conditions of confinement. Mm -hmm. So again, that's going to be next Thursday at the same time, 7 p.m. Eastern. We hope to see you there. Mm -hmm. um, thank you all for your support. Thank you for joining us this evening. Congratulations again to Dr. James. And uh, good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much.